Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or wherever you may be today. Uh, I'm John Carroll, the editor of Endpoints News, and your host for today's webinar on keeping the supply chain intact, the COVID-19 challenge. Before we get into the panel presentation, though, I would like to introduce our sponsor for today's uh, webinar. Uh, it's Steve Knoll with Grand River. Steve? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, as John mentioned, my name is Steve Knoll at Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing. Uh, Grand River Aseptic is a CDMO that delivers high quality fill finish for injectable drug products. We have a wide range of capabilities uh, from formulation through sterile filling and packaging for both small molecule and large molecule drug products. We've been in business for uh, just over 10 years. We've been rapidly growing. We started out as a, a up and coming uh, startup with about eight to 10 employees and we've grown to 2000 plus or 200 plus employees uh, in the past 10 years. Um, over the past four years, we've been ranked on Inc. Uh, 5000's fastest growing companies in uh, the United States. Um, we have a three facilities um, encompassing over 100,000 square feet of GMP space. And all those facilities are within one square mile in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we just recently uh, completed a fill finish facility uh, for a large scale 60,000 square foot advanced aseptic manufacturing facility. Um, and we are looking forward to this opportunity to have this uh, conversation in light of this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, for us, it's critical <clears throat> um, to maintain the supply chain. We have obligations to our customers to supply them with drug product and any impact to the supply chain can severely cripple our ability to supply customers with drug product. So we've constantly had to monitor our supply chain um, vendors or suppliers. Um, we've, we've had to incorporate secondary suppliers. And in some instances, some instances we've even had to create uh, new validated manufacturing processes to assure that uh, when we have issues with consumables that we still can produce drug product. So we're looking forward to this conversation and looking forward uh, to this learning opportunity with the SMEs on the phone. And I guess with that, uh, John, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thanks. And thanks for sponsoring today's conversation, one of the series that we've got going on related to COVID-19. I want to quickly introduce everybody on the panel today. Um, I'm joined by Evan Lowe, the Chief Executive, Chief Executive Officer at Paratech, Ann McDonald Pritchett, the Senior Vice President, Policy and Research for Pharma, Craig Kennedy, the Senior Vice President, Transformation and Supply Chain Management for Merck, and John DiLoretto, the Executive Director of the Bulk Pharmaceuticals Task Force, who's been working on supply chain for quite some time. Um, this is an incredibly complex issue. Just a couple of weeks ago, we learned that the US had issued a $354 million contract to a Virginia startup flow that started uh, to make, uh, will start to make certain drugs and active ingredients. Um, it was heralded by some of the uh, people closest to, to the White House, including Peter Navarro, who said, this is a great day for America. This is all of the elements of the Trump strategy. It's made in the USA, it's innovation that will allow American workers to compete with the pollution havens, sweatshops, and tax havens of the world. There's a much rumored executive order floating around out there somewhere in the White House where the president has given his full-throated support for bringing the supply chain, and that's the entire US drug supply chain and all the jobs back to the United States, if that's even possible. And it's not just the US, but we've also seen a lot of other countries now begin to take action to build their own supply chains. Uh, in the UK this morning, there was a $125 million uh, project announced to build a vaccine manufacturing facility for future pandemics. It'll be, it won't be online until the end of next year. Um, these are not easy facilities to construct. Meanwhile, tensions with China continue to grow as we speak. We saw the Houston consulate being shut down um, amid allegations related to biomedical theft uh, in the Houston area, and so on. So a lot's going on here right now, and uh, a lot for the panel to discuss. Before we get into the full conversation, though, 
I did want to point out to the audience that uh, you have an opportunity there on your screen to pitch a question to anybody you'd like or just the panel as a whole. So during our conversation, we're going to get to the Q&A towards the end of this presentation, but um, during this, if anything uh, suggests itself to you, if you'd like to direct a question to us, uh, go ahead and put that in and we'll be sorting through those questions as we, uh, as we go through the topic. So I'd like to get it over to the panel right now. What have we, what, there were tremendous concerns at the beginning of this that COVID-19 would slam the drug supply chain, um, that we'd see a tremendous number of shortages. What have you learned from, from this experience so far? How has the supply chain been affected by the pandemic? And, and what have we learned from this experience? Craig, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, really good points. And certainly, just to uh, echo what you said, definitely a lot going on. And certainly those concerns that you highlighted at the beginning of the pandemic were very, very uh, apparent, certainly in the public sector, but also in the private sector as well. What we probably have learned more than anything is the strategy which makes sure that our supply chains are resilient and capable to respond, no matter where they may be located in the world, is a really important strategy to have in preparation for any event like this or any other kind of disaster. That doesn't necessarily have to be just the nationalization of a specific supply chain, but it's the ability to make sure that you have alternate sources of, of particular components, that you have appropriate inventory strategies, and in some cases, specific, uh, specific examples of being able to, to multi-source certain elements of the supply chain. And it's just been proven time and time again through this pandemic and through elements of all parts of the supply chain from very uh, early raw materials, even through to the distribution of pharmaceuticals, that having that resilience and flexibilities in multiple forms is the most important thing to continue supply. So John, what do you hear from your members and, and the people that you talk with in terms of the lessons learned from this and what the impact has been on the supply chain? Well, one of the things that's uh, very important, and, and thank you for allowing me to be here today, I really appreciate it. I want to echo a little bit about what Craig is saying, because one of the things uh, that's been uh, a, a major discussion item has been the nationalization of the industry, trying, and from the standpoint of trying to bring it all back to the U.S. When I talk to my European colleagues, it's all about bringing all of the manufacturing back to Europe. Uh, yet when we look at the industry, the industry has worked uh, for decades really to try to spread out uh, the manufacturing and the supply chain to a very large extent to try to minimize the impact that could occur in any one part of the world. Uh, when, when we look at the uh, location of many of the facilities in terms of manufacturing uh, bulk APIs, for instance, uh, it's not all located in one location. While we might have about 25% of that occurring here in the U.S. and another 25% in China, we're looking at the rest of the world uh, uh, having a very large impact in terms of the uh, availability of manufacturing capacity, uh, both manufacturing capacity and supplies. Uh, I find it interesting. I was interested in, in, in hearing more about uh, the issue that Steve Knoll had mentioned before. Uh, the issue that uh, they were having was more along the line of the consumables rather than from the standpoint of having enough starting materials to actually uh, conduct their manufacturing operations. So I, I think we need to uh, take a very broad look at what that supply chain looks like. Uh, rather than trying to bring it to any one part of the world, that uh, broadening it out is perhaps a, a better option. And I think many of the companies, in fact, some of the companies I see here represent today, ha have, have taken that, that similar approach so that if one part of the world is a problem, uh, you can go to another part of the world for manufacturing rather than, than uh, relying on one part. Uh, and, and I think that's an important approach. So Anne, obviously pharma's got a big uh, hand in, in this issue as, as it's playing out in Washington, D.C. right now. So from what you've been able to learn from your members, which would include all the major manufacturers, um, what, what was the big come away here? I mean, have we seen, uh, have most of the fears passed in terms of supply chain interruption? Um, has this worked to our advantage, the supply chain that it's got, or, or do you see areas that do need to be changed? Well, I think first uh, you had mentioned that there was this fear at the beginning that we were going to see major disruptions in the supply chain as a result of dependence on China. 
but the FDA has said we haven't seen any major disruptions due to reliance on API from China. What we have seen though are really intense localized surges in demand for critical medicines, primarily ICU drugs in needed to treat those with COVID-19. And I would say that's an area where the public and private sector have come together very quickly. The FEMA very quickly identified, here are five essential medicines where we have such an increase in demand that we need to identify other manufacturing capacity that we can bring to a bear to address this challenge. They put out an RFI, innovator, engineering, manufacturers, CDMOs jumped in to help address and help increase capacity for those localized surges in demand. And I think that's the right approach. And I think approaches like that, which Evan is engaged on with BARDA, where it's trying to address identified gaps in the system, that's the approach. We shouldn't be focused on onshoring. We should be focused on how do we ensure appropriate resiliency in our supply chain. So uh, tell us about your uh, uh, relationship, Evan. I mean, this is obviously a very important initiative for your company. Um, how has this model been developed and, and how does, do you think it can be applied most effectively elsewhere in the industry? Well, again, John, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And, you know, Anne, thank you for bringing up our, our BARDA uh, public-private partnership that we uh, consummated actually in December of last year. And it was one of these um, uh, relationships where BARDA actually was very prescient. Uh, an RFP came out even uh, at the beginning of 2019, and they were looking for uh, an opportunity to develop a novel antibiotic for a bioterrorism pathogen. In our particular case, it turned out to be anthrax. And our once daily oral and intravenous uh, product having just recently been approved by the FDA for community acquired bacterial pneumonia, plus the fact that we had an established FDA uh, uh, inspected uh, supply chain from API through drug product, uh, gave them the confidence to give us this award to uh, uh, support not only the development of our product for uh, anthrax through the FDA animal rule, but there was also uh, capital actually uh, given to us to actually develop a US-based uh, supply chain uh, for uh, for our product. And <clears throat> going back to some of the earlier comments, you know, I I worry about supply chain every single day. I mean, we just have one product and we are single sourced at this point in time. And there isn't a day that doesn't go by that I don't worry about supply chain. And so by having the ability with our partnership through BARDA, John, to be able to actually bring a mature uh, US-based onshoring uh, uh, supply chain is uh, something that we would have never have been able as a single product small biotech company been able to invest in. And unlike Craig, <laughs> who has the deep resources of Merck, uh, you know, we not only are thinking about, and this supply chain primarily has been focused on API through drug product, but we're also thinking about, you know, the, the various different reagents, catalysts, and intermediates, as you mentioned, Craig, that are very vital that also some of those are actually sourced through, you know, company, uh, countries such as China. And when you put that all together, you know, the other main difference between, you know, in, in addition to having, you know, I think better visibility on IP and control that way, it's really, as I think uh, some of the other folks have already mentioned, it's about surge capacity. You know, the vendors that we're looking at in the U.S. Uh, are very different than what we have in Europe. I mean, the European vendors that we chose, which are very reputable and very well established, you know, we're pretty much just in time based upon our commercial demand. But I think as part of this barter relationship, what they are looking for in the US government is not only high level security for that supply chain, but also the ability to surge at the time of demands of such as pandemic, you know, for pandemic preparedness to the level of sometimes even 5X to 10X above our base uh, productivity. So I think that those are some, I think, aspects of this particular relationship with BARDA that I think are very prescient and I think unique uh, to be able to supply a life-saving antibiotic as part of broad-based pandemic preparedness as part of the end-to-end -end solutions of not just the antivirals, the vaccines, the diagnostics, but also to deal with the secondary bacterial infections that a lot of patients are dying of as part of this COVID pandemic. So Craig, I want to get your response here. I mean, because there's, there's a there seems to be a lot of different types of issues here on the table. I mean, there's one thing to have a small company, you know, needing assistance to, you know, add some redundancies to provide, you know, a supply as needed. Something else when you start to talk about whether you should change the overall dynamic 
of having a situation where 72% of manufacturers of pharmaceutical ingredients are coming from overseas into the United States. So do you see a role here for the government, I mean, that, that makes sense? Or, and, and where do you draw the line? Where do you start to say this does not make sense? So I think, you know, starting with the last part of the question first, as Anne said earlier, I think there's a point in time where broad-based legislation to just do something, whether it's nationalization or a, a unilateral uh, specific approach doesn't make sense. It actually reduces the flexibility of companies like ours or any specific company. And it also, uh, in those cases then, can work against the goal of ensuring supply. What I think is the role of government is actually to help solve the problems and provide the incentives necessary to allow companies like ours and the others represented on this call to innovatively find solutions. We're dealing with a, a very important problem right now in the form of a pandemic, and it's certainly broad based and affecting a large part of the world. But it's not the only kind of problem that we can deal with. It's just the one that's facing us right now. There are increasingly disruptions in supply chains associated with climate change. There are increasingly disruptions in supply chains associated with cyber events and other kinds of geopolitical disturbances as well. And so to have a unilateral large scale response, which just says make things here, that actually reduces your flexibility. It reduces your resilience rather than increasing it. And so having the government partner to solve problems is a good way to go about getting things to be better for patients and customers in the long run. Having governments try to actually dictate how you do something isn't an effective way of doing that. So yeah. John and Ed, I want to play devil's advocate here for a second, uh, because obviously there's a tremendous amount of political support for a form of nationalization of the drug supply chain in the United States. It, it's one of those issues that tends to play, tends to resonate very well in, in large groups. Um, and I think that's why we're going to continue to hear about this for a while. But what's wrong with the idea of, of saying, okay, we've shifted this huge amount of the drug supply chain overseas outside of the country we've seen that there's a need to have some things done here um, there's a, a greater desire for all sorts of different reasons to do that so so what's wrong with the idea of trying to re-engineer that and reverse this tidal shift in the way drug supply is handled in the united states and let's start with you sure ha happy to start with that First, I think there's a lack of recognition of the benefits of having a highly resilient, globally diverse supply chain. Um, if we had been, if the U.S. had been the center of the pandemic as China was, our, we would have had major disruptions throughout the supply chain if everything were located in the U.S. The reason why after Hurricane Maria, which impacted 50 manufacturing facil facilities in Puerto Rico, the reason why we didn't see major disruptions in the drug supply chain is because Companies like Merck do have redundancies in their system, substantial inventory management systems, um, alternative suppliers and manufacturer and production facilities that are lined up ready to allow us to shift. When we've seen hurricanes uh, result in large scale funding in North and South Carolinas, our vaccine facilities in those states were still able to ensure that vaccine needs of US patients were met because they were able to make those adjustments because of their extensive business continuity plans and inventory management systems. I think there's also a lack of recognition that we actually have 1300 manufacturing and production facilities in the US. So this idea that we're wholly reliant on China just isn't true. Otherwise we would have seen massive disruptions in the supply chain as a result of COVID-19. Now to the points made by Craig and others, should we ensure that we have sufficient resiliency in the system? Yes. If we do have situations where we have medicines that are potentially sole sourcing from countries that are viewed um, as creating a public health risk or national security concern, should we address those? Yes. And I think that's actually what the administration has been doing. When FEMA put out the RFI for five essential medicines, they deemed those to be of national security importance and public health importance and we're concerned about the need to kind of build that surge capacity that we've been talking about. And so they look for how do we build resiliency in the system? And we think that's the right approach to be taking, but um, John, happy for so, you to uh, jump in as well. Yeah, John, so just, just to kind of amplify it, maybe take this a little bit further as well. 
I, I have never heard all the details of the flow contract. Obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of attention for that. It was hundreds of millions of dollars up front. There's hundreds of millions of dollars possibly later on, depending on how the contract plays out. But not really sure what they're going to be doing and, and what they're going to be making. Have you heard that? And, 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 and are, there, are there things that ought to be made in the United States? Uh, sure. Uh, in fact, you, you bring a, a couple of great issues up. The uh, let's talk for a moment about the uh, uh, recent the contract you mentioned. Uh, I, I think one of the things that that was intended to do was to uh, initiate some uh, some additional uh, manufacturing capacity uh, here in the U.S. by building a new facility uh, dedicated to some of the essential medicines that are required. Now. That said, I think there's a couple of good points here from a policy perspective we should be thinking about. Uh, we should have uh, an essential, uh, a stockpile of essential medicines. We, if we're going to look at medicine uh, as a, a, a national security issue, then we need to make sure that we have uh, a stockpile. Uh, and that stockpile really should be enough to take us through at least the initial stages of any emergency that we foresee coming up, whether they're biological, uh, whether it's a war, whether it's climate change, whatever it is that's causing that emergency, I think we need to make sure that we at least start with the uh, World Health Organization's list of essential medicines and use that as a, a starting point for what we should be keeping on hand on a regular basis. And that should be supplemented uh, by anything that's going to be required for any specific circumstance, for instance, like the pandemic that we're dealing with right now. If the pandemic is forcing us uh, to uh, use up a lot of medicine that we didn't think uh, that we didn't have in the stockpile because we weren't really certain that that was going to be needed, well, now we've come to a point where we've got enough experience where we can see what we need. We should be using that stockpile as uh, very much like what we talked about the uh, shutdown. Well, well, the shutdown was really not meant to solve the problem. It was really meant to buy us some time. And I think that that's one of the things that this stockpile can do. Uh, as I've heard a couple of the panelists mention, we've got a lot of capacity uh, worldwide, really, to gear up manufacturing in a fairly uh, fast basis to, real, to get uh, uh, into production some of those things that we're going to need that are going to be specific to whatever situation we face right now. Uh, so we've got the stockpile of the uh, redundancy uh, and resiliency, I think is really critical. And I, I think that uh, you know, several of the folks have made a comment about, uh, gosh, if we restrict it to one country or one location or one part of the world, that really hurts the capability of any company to uh, really uh, uh, expand rapidly, to uh, 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 bring things back into production quickly. If, if their starting materials are all coming from one part of the world and they can't get it anymore, then they're not going to be able to uh, 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 develop those uh, uh, APIs like they need to be developed and, and sent into the, to the supply chain. So it's important that we look, we emphasize what we're gonna need for national security uh, have those medicines uh, stockpiled, but be ready to expand on a moment's notice. I think that's one of the things our policies could be doing uh, would be uh, the ability to uh, expand outward on a moment's notice. And, uh, there's no reason why we, we couldn't use uh, what we already have at our disposal. So Evan, I'm curious from your own perspective, because you now have some hands-on uh, experience working with this. The discussion related to shifting around, being able to use the a resilient system that we've got right now to supply what's needed when it's needed. How complex is this for an individual company such as yourself in order to handle this and to work these things through? Because I'm definitely not an expert, but from what everything I hear, you know, these facilities are difficult to build. Uh, build. Um, they require inspection. Uh, companies frequently in the industry, in my coverage, run into CMC issues over and over and over again, um, almost to the point where you think that they just really weren't paying attention. So what are the complexities that come into something like this? What are the complexities and concerns in terms of shaping national policy? Well, I think it's a, you know, it's a very, very broad-based question, but it's really important. And you know, uh, I appreciate all the comments that have come prior. You know, I, I would say that as you think about legislative components that will help small companies like ours, is that we don't have a massive integrated network like Craig does, you know, through the resources of a big multinational. And, you know, one of the reasons that we went to Europe, besides the cost basis being very low, is that 
certain critical processes are no longer actually uh, conducted here in the US. For example, fermentation. Fermentation, Craig knows this, has essentially basically moved offshore into Europe. So there's no option for me to do that here. And what we've got to do is find capabilities here, technical capabilities of manufacturers that are willing to bring back that resource. So as you think about you know, legislative components of, of what we want to have, we need to think in detail about what those supply chain components are and to make sure, as John said, there's a way that we could surge if we need to, to basically get it up and ramped up if we need to make, let's say, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics. So Craig, fermentation, other issues? I mean, it's an example of one. I mean, if you if you look at what's happened in the U.S. itself over the course of the past 20 to 30 years, it's very true that many of the things which may have been more commodity-like in nature have moved offshore. I think that you're back, John, to the earlier part of your question, what's wrong with having um, a, a policy or a, a strategy that says buy American or make American? Absolutely nothing. But it has to be in a way that's absolutely sustainable for the companies that are going to invest in it and do it. And actually has to support the long-term goals, both of their customers and also of their shareholders in many cases as well. That includes the education system, that includes the regulatory environment, that includes the industrial environment in general, that actually makes it thrive and prosper. And as Evan pointed out, in some of those cases, it is more effective to do it in other parts of the world right now. Well, for a variety of reasons, this gets into the other area in terms of, of training and education as it relates to whether the people are here that can do this. And because once you move the technology overseas, you also move the training overseas to the education of the workforce. You have trained workforces now, that are now based overseas rather than in the United States. So there were seem to be a variety of different kind of big hurdles in terms of, of doing some of these sorts of things. John, I mean, in terms of training, education, and so on, at a time when the government's been uh, fairly strict as it relates to immigration, I mean, is, are these issues that could uh, affect this debate? Absolutely. In fact, one, it's probably one of the biggest complaints I get from, from my members is not having enough trained staff, uh, trained uh, people that they can bring right into their operation and, and get up and running quickly. They don't feel like there's enough uh, emphasis at the, uh, uh, the collegiate uh, level uh, to uh, train folks to have them uh, ready to step right into a pharmaceutical operation and work. Uh, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on STEM programs, uh, but the pharmacological end of it, we don't really have enough uh, uh, educational opportunities for people to uh, really move right into the role that, that might be needed to, particularly in an emergency kind of situation. Uh, one of the biggest complaints, as I said, is, is uh, uh, the ability to get enough staff uh, with an at, with adequate training, and if we move everything offshore, if we move them to other parts of the world, that's where those training opportunities are going to arise. So we're we're going to miss out on both ends. John, if I can uh, if I can add in there, there are positive signs in the U.S. and there are decent state-based models which actually try to address this problem. If you look at the state of North Carolina or even Indiana they have specific public-private partnerships where they try to develop an education system, a training program, and a pipeline of actual talent uh, in and around where um, specific pharmaceutical companies, in this case, might be located in order to try to solve that problem. So the public-private partnership can actually work in developing the kind of talent that we need both now and in the future, but it has to be a conscious effort, which has to be broad-based if you want to address the kind of issues that have been brought up during the course of this pandemic. Yeah, and John, just to build on that further, you know, it, it's something that you brought up earlier. It's not just having the manufacturing technical expertise that you can access. Companies, biotech companies like ours, we never want to compromise outsourcing our internal manufacturing capabilities. You must have the ability to be the expert in your processes. You, you outsource the technical pieces, then the challenge comes, can you find the technicians with the capabilities or even the equipment? You know, large volume reactors, large volume HPLCs. And can I have the ability to actually access those reactors at the right time versus what they've already committed to, to other larger scale uh, production uh, commitments from that standpoint? So it's, it's really a, a balance here in terms of how to allocate our capital in a way that not only fills today's demand, 
but because of our barter relationship, I can actually then commit to surge demand where I could not even contemplate that because it could take me a year from the initiation of my first API campaign to getting drug product out of the, at the back end. Because I don't, I have to manage my inventory through managing pieces of my supply chain as opposed to being able to just surge and actually increase my, my, uh, my capacity. So, Anne, one of the areas, I mean, obviously the Trump administration is not singling out any particular country in a certain respect as it relates to supply chain reform. They made clear that they're just as interested in getting back to manufacturing operations in Ireland as they are in China. At the same time, though, obviously tension with China is growing at a rapid pace. Um, and uh, there seems to be uh, just a general worsening of the general environment and the trade relations between China and the United States. I mean, do you think whether or not this is a, a supply chain issue globally, that there's going to be some sort of a specific problem related to China that may have to be addressed if, if the trade relations grow even worse? Well, I think that um, the trade issues that we're experiencing with China aren't issues that have happened overnight. There have been ongoing challenges related to China. I would say that the, um, the, there's a lot of concern from a cybersecurity perspective of attacks by foreign actors, particularly as it relates to COVID-19 research. And I think that's exacerbating the concerns. I think that there are concerns about reliance on any one country that could pose a national security concern. I don't think it's limited to China, but also these aren't new concerns. You know, I've been at Pharma for 15 years, and I think every year for those 15 years, the US-China Committee has come out with reports raising concerns in this space. But I think it's also important to recognize that we're not going to see change overnight. The issues that have been raised around STEM, um, you know, let's just look at what some of the infrastructure challenges are that the US has to meet. U.S. produces about 10% of the bachelor's degrees in science and engineering. China produces 50%. The labor costs for the STEM workforce in China and India are 30, 40%, sometimes even um, more highly discounted versus the U.S. We don't have some of the advanced manufacturing capacity. We don't have um, a lot of the capabilities that Evan and Craig and John have talked about in the U.S. So even if they wanted to say, bring everything back tomorrow. It's just not feasible because of these broader infrastructure issues that need to be addressed. So I think we need to be looking at how do we make it more attractive for companies to make more investments in the US, not just for our industry, but I would say for all advanced mm -hmm. manufacturing industries, because we're the types of industries that you're gonna need in terms of economic recovery. We are, we are um, let, we're more resilient in terms of economic crisis we have very high wage jobs, high job multipliers. So I think we're the type of um, industries that are, you know, all on this call today that are going to help um, support the U.S. in the future. So I think we want to avoid any policies that are going to result in major disruptions in the supply chain. And I think we all hope that we're going to see some normalization in terms of trade policies and engagement with other entities. But um, you know, I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge, just as it has been for you know more than a decade. You know, just to build on that, John, it's not just a technical and, uh, you know, scientific STEM resources, as, as, as Anne's mentioned, to put a finer point on it, you know, the, I think the lay discussions around API is, is interesting, but as Craig and John and, and Anne know, there are precious, you know, precious metals and other reagents and catalysts that come from only certain processes in terms of where it's produced. And, uh, we as a small company have to think about different ways to create our own processes because I think we're vulnerable in those places as well. And so uh, there are many elements along a complex supply chain that John, as you've already mentioned, that we really need to think about and that keep us up uh, pretty much every night. Right, right, Craig? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so Craig, um, in terms of all of this, one of the things that we have seen is that there have been, there has been a geographic basis for the way the vaccine production is breaking out. Countries have been going for, you know, their own stockpiles. There's been a scramble to get in the front of the line. Um, you've got com companies now that are signing contracts for vaccine supplies, for drug supplies. In, vaccine, in the case of vaccines, before they've even started phase three, in many cases, you're already seeing the contracts that are going out there. Moderna, 
said that uh, they were going to use their U.S. production for the U.S. supply. They were going to use their ex-U.S. production for the ex-U.S. supply. Um, obviously, we saw the U.K. today setting up their own vaccine supply. Do you think that we're likely to come, one of the big changes of this looks like that the country specifically, or a lot of countries specifically, are going to make sure that they've got their own supply. And if they don't have it, they're going to make it in terms of vaccines for pandemics. Yeah, I think it's fair. You know, one of the things that I refer back to when, um, when I have discussions like that is something our CEO, Ken Frazier, said, which I think is important for everybody to remember, which is effectively that until everybody is safe, nobody is safe in this specific pandemic, right? And so the rush to make sure that one particular population is safe is probably understandable, but not necessarily the complete solution. I think also it's important given that context that companies like ours and many others are actually going to use the most readily available assets that they have in order to be most successful in bringing the safest product they possibly can to market in the shortest period of time. And that may be such that they can manufacture in one geography for that specific geography, but it may be that they need to use those assets in other geographies to best satisfy the total demand that they possibly can. And I think, you know, as, as um, Anne mentioned earlier, um, there, these facilities that we're talking about in terms of vaccine manufacturing, and even in some cases, the therapeutic manufacturing, they don't turn up overnight. They often take years and sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars to build. And so what you're seeing now is companies that are either making choices to subjugate one product for another potential product or retrofitting or spending large sums of capital just to do the right thing in terms of bringing this forward. And I think that those considerations are probably the most important ones rather than where exactly it's being made for exactly what market. And if I might add, I think what we're gonna see over time is that we're gonna see stronger relationships between US trusted trading partners, right? Because everyone in the short term is how do we ensure that we are able to meet the needs of our patients in our country but I think what we're gonna see over time as you look at the magnitude of the number of people that we're gonna to have to vaccinate and treat, I think that it's gonna result in more collaboration and stronger relationships between our trusted trading partners as you know, certainly we are very, work very closely with a number of European countries. And I think that's what we're gonna see more of, hopefully. John, let's get your perspective on this as well. I'm sorry, I was just going to say, you know, we're already seeing some of that, uh, what Ann was just talking about on the uh, uh, FDA enforcement side, where we've got uh, mutual recognition agreements with other countries to do inspections, for instance, where uh, the US uh, FDA would accept an, an inspection conducted by uh, uh, a European Medicines Agency employee uh, or staff uh, over in Europe, so that uh, there doesn't need to be this uh, duplication of effort on the enforcement side. But I think one of the things we, we um, the, you know, we're about to uh, start on another round of negotiations for user fees on generic drugs. And I think one of the questions we're going to be talking about is going to be uh, why it takes so long to bring these new operations into, into the marketplace. Why does it take years, for instance, for a generic drug to be approved when, when a brand name drug can be approved in a year? Or, or less, what, what's the, what is the problem there? Why does it take so many cycles for a generic drug? We need to look at ways of making it a little bit more efficient. And what, one of the things we've noticed in this pandemic is that we've got a lot of companies that have been able to, to bring things to the marketplace fairly quickly. FDA has worked with them to make things move a whole lot faster. So I think we need to have a little, a few more of those discussions to find out how we can do that on a more permanent basis, uh, because we need to have as much flexibility and, and uh, to be able to work with all due speed as much as possible. We're, we're in a rapidly evolving world. Uh, we, we can't wait for years to, to, for things to take place. We're, we've got a capital intensive business. We've got a lot of barriers to entry. We need to reduce those barriers as much as we possibly can. So whether you support it or not, do you think when this is all this pandemic is said and done, that most countries, most major industrialized countries are going to work out their own vaccine supplies? 
for future pandemics, not for the not for the current one. That they're going to do whatever it takes to make certain that they don't have to go looking or bidding for vaccine supply when they need it. If it if it were my country, I certainly would be thinking along those lines, because I think one of the concerns that we need to uh, uh, take into consideration is that uh, uh, our partners may not always be as reliable. We may have a, an alliance with a country today that tomorrow may not, that alliance may look very different. So if you really want to be as prepared as possible, you're gonna look for having as much capacity within your own, uh, uh, within your own country as, to the greatest extent possible. Look, I think that the, you know, John, I think from a pandemic preparedness perspective, I think COVID has been a massive wake up call. Yeah. And I think there's a reality between, you know, if you think about end to end solutions for pandemic preparedness that includes antivirals as well as antibacterials. You know, this goes to something that John spoke to as well. The development times are really, really long and we have to be realistic about it. I think, you know, the, the Merck Ebola vaccine was about five years in development. I think the average time for development for a um, antibacterial is runs around 10 plus years. So if you can imagine, you know, in the best case scenario, we have a vaccine that's available sometime within the year. We may have lost a year to two years you know, in, in, in our lives today, but can you imagine losing a decade if, uh, if, it was, if the next uh, pandemic was actually bacterial, like, you know, was in the 15th, 16th century. So it's, I think countries have, have an obligation here to not only be, you know, be prepared for what's here today, but just think about the future. And without it, it's not going to be ready just in time. This, the processes are way too complicated, and we may not have the internal capabilities to be able to turn on a dime. Yeah, John, I think just one thing to add there. We, even prior to the the full um, the full uh, evolution of the pandemic, we were already seeing as an industry different uh, governments in different geographies around the world start to roll out legislation which required specific amounts of inventory to be kept in the markets that they had for certain products. So it's probably exacerbated by the current circumstance. And I think, as Evan said, for specific classes of product, there will probably be a even higher um, focus on making sure that those products are available on mass as needed. Um, but the good news is there are effective models for that around the world, including what the CDC does with vaccine stockpiling in the US today. And so it's something that I think that governments will need to focus on. But the notion that everybody has their own production facility is probably not something that we should either encourage or necessarily expect to happen. Yeah. And how about you? I agree with the comments made by Craig. I think we're going to need to ensure we have resiliency for certain key items in terms of the strategic national stockpile. But I don't think it's going to be practical or necessarily well advised to ensure that every country has self-contained global self-contained supply chains for every medicine imaginable, that it's feasible, that it's cost effective, or that it makes sense. If, uh, and I'm going to put this out to everybody, if we've learned that the supply chain, the drug supply chain globally is resilient and can be adjusted here and there to everyone's advantage, um, I am kind of curious, I want to get your feedback in terms of what you're seeing or what you see is likely to happen uh, a little bit down the road. Um, the initial impact was whether or not the drugs that were needed and in the system today would continue to be supplied on time, whether there would be any interruptions. Um, a lot of people or a number of people are concerned in terms of whether the system has the capacity to take on the vaccine supply and take on the, the, uh, the antibody developments and, and drugs out there for, for therapeutics for this, um, all at the same time while doing everything else. Um, there has been a rush in the industry to, to get these programs up, to get them on track and to hopefully have them out in a matter of months, which would be absolutely extraordinary. By anyone's calculation, that would be absolutely extraordinary. But do you anticipate that the supply chain system that we have now, today, as it exists, is going to be able to handle, under the best of circumstances, the demands that are going to be put on it when, for everything, uh, where you have the, all the regular supplies that are required, on top of which billions of doses of vaccine and drugs would be needed as well? Craig, let's start with you. Do you think that the system can handle it? 
uh, do I think it can handle it? Without adjustment, the answer is no. But I believe that the adjustment needed for that is being actively focused on by many groups and many governments around the world today. So I have confidence that we will be able to. I think, however, just to round out that remark, it's important to understand, as you just said, you're having to vaccinate, assuming we get successful vaccines, and assuming that they are actually uh, effective for a, a decent period of time, you're having to vaccinate billions of people. And that is even under the best of circumstances, that's not going to happen immediately. And therefore, you know, I refer back to remarks that my friend and colleague Julie Gerberding made even this week, which is that our approach to managing the current pandemic has to be a, a combination of extremely good discipline, personal accountability, the, the public health things that we've been stressing for a long period of time in conjunction with the rollout of effective therapeutics and vaccines, because it is still going to take a while, even under the best of circumstances. Yeah, I mean, just to build on that, John, if you were to think about our particular BARDA arrangement um, and what the CARES Act has, I think, tossed in the direction of BARDA, to enlarge the SNS, I think that's the first step is to get the SNS up to snuff that you can actually cover the right number of Americans in order to be able to deal with the pandemic. But our supply chain that we are committed to is gonna be a solid three year timeline to get it all the way up and running, but also then to do the validation work and then put our material on stability and then have the FDA come in and inspect it before we can actually release the, a single vial or a single tablet. So this all has a regulatory, I think, overhang that is appropriate. I think it's the right way to, to demand high quality products that we would expect for every American that would take one of our products. But we have to be thinking not only about today in terms of pandemic preparedness for an outbreak that could happen tomorrow, but also taking a longer view of what are those internal capabilities and what are those essential products that we want to actually legislate that we have to have internal capabilities here in the US. It's not for everybody and I agree with everyone's comments. It's gonna to have to be selective and we're gonna to have, to have to have the right dialogue with the right experts to make those decisions. John, what are your thoughts on that? You know, one of the things that uh, kind of surprised me is, um, uh, I shouldn't say surprise, one of the things I was glad to see is that we saw so much flexibility within our sector uh, that companies were able to really adjust their operations, for instance, uh, uh, their staffing levels, the way they produce, uh, the number of people that they have in their shop at any one time, um, the way they look at their supply chain in general, uh, looking at how much inventory they're, they're retaining at any one point in time, how, what, how many sources they have for their inventory. You know, it, it, one of the things that this has pointed out, I, I think uh, Greg said this is a wake-up call, uh, and I, or, or Evan, uh, and, and I think it's, a, it's aptly put because uh, this really gives us an opportunity to look at just about everything we're doing. Uh, are we looking at the way we maintain our inventory uh, of starting materials? Do we have enough? Are we, are we prepared for a big problem to hit at any one point in time? Do we have the appropriate staff in place? Can we really push through product like we would need to? Do we have the capacity to do it in the event we needed to expand quickly? I think this is a really good opportunity for the industry to take a, a good look, uh, a, a good introspective view of how they're operating and whether or not they're really prepared for, for uh, future pandemics, for, for instance. Okay. So I want to get a few of the different questions that we have from the audience right now. Again, if you've got a question, go ahead and pitch it. Um, we've got a few different ones to go through. Um, the first question is, I'm just going to throw this one out here. It, it's an interesting one. It relates to nationalization and what, what, is, what do you mean by nationalization? Could you elaborate a little on the nationalization strategy? Is the idea behind it to make DSDP just in U.S. soil rather than make it by an all-American company? As most of the CDMOs in the United States are subsidiaries of foreign companies. John, you want to take that on? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. 
Uh, and thank you for that, because uh, it does raise a lot of issues. Uh, for instance, when we talk about Buy American, are we talking about the product? We're talk how much of that product, uh, for instance, when a tablet is made, uh, how much of that product needs to be made in America to be considered Amer an American product? Um, uh, where are the starting materials coming from? Is the company that manufactures it just based in the US and owned by a foreign company? Or is it a, an American company uh, all, you know, through and through. I think those are excellent questions. And I think that our friends on the Hill have struggled with this as well. And uh, I, I think I would lean more toward uh, what some of our colleagues here have said about uh, not looking at nationalizing. And when we talk about nationalizing, we're, ta we're not talking about the government owning the facility. We're just talking about uh, being able to control within our geographical boundaries, uh, the full manufacturing of, of a therapeutic. So. Uh, it, it's an important question. I think it deserves a lot more discussion than what we've had so far. So, Ann, it, it is an incredibly complex international global economy that we're working in. Um, obviously, companies that you know manufacture drugs have a variety of investments and backers and facilities all around the world. So it's it is kind of hard. I, is it even possible to have an all American made drug supply? in the United States by American-owned companies? Not for every medicine, and it shouldn't be the goal. Yeah, I, would, I, I, I don't see how that could happen. And it's already, I mean, there already been some instances, you know, of, of you know, foreign or ownership, which is really quite common. Craig, how about you? I mean, in terms of, uh, not, you know, whether or not the U.S. can, can have an American-made drug supply. Well, just to give you the just to give you the BARDA definition, it was not enough to be able to manufacture drug substance or drug product here. Yeah. Uh, we needed to have API onshore here, yeah. and uh, there's you know as I mentioned before, you know we're thinking about the critical intermediates and reagents as, as well, but uh, they wanted API here all the way through to uh, drug product. So I think, John, I'd just um, echo what Anne said um, in terms of her remarks, and and add if I could that. Um, there are actually plenty of examples of um, wholly made drugs and vaccines in the U.S. already, which are either for the U.S. market or distributed uh, internationally. That's already the case. Uh, I think we need to be careful not to conflate the reasons for the Buy American push and or making Make American push or nationalization push. At the beginning of the pandemic, the stated reasons were to ensure security of the supply chain and to make sure that uh, American patients and customers had access to the therapies that they needed to have access to. And I would say our argument to that would be that a nationalization strategy is not necessarily the most effective way to actually do that. Now, if you can separate out other reasons for Buy American, which you know I personally am all for in terms of investment and developing an industry and training and education and all those kind of things, they're good policy goals but they're not necessarily the, the reasons that are being pushed forward at the moment. So here's another question. If there has to be a component involving man, uh, manufacturing OUS, even if just to have some redundancies, how has the thinking evolved around facilities in India versus Eastern Europe or China? Anyone want to take, Anne, you want to take that on? I mean, that's individual company decisions, so I don't feel I, I can comment on. Greg, how about you? Yeah, what I would say is that, you know, we evaluate not only the geographic placement of um, the facilities where they are, but very importantly, the company, their reputation from a quality perspective, their financial ability and so forth. And most importantly, overall, how they add or contribute to the resiliency of our supply chain and our ability to meet our core mission of putting things to, to the market in all places where patients uh, that we serve are. And so it's not that we look at one geography or another as good or bad. We look at it in the way that it would actually help or hurt our actual supply chains. And so we don't look at it as one specific geography or another. Yeah, in so, our particular case, in our particular case, John, it was about quality. You know, if you have a, one product and you have a single source supply chain, you've got to make sure that they've got a DMF for your, you know, for your products. They've been FDA inspected and they've actually proven uh, that they could actually do this at at the appropriate scale. Small companies, you just can't have a fail. And that's why we went to Europe because they had the technical capabilities. And in our particular case, we're not abandoning Europe. 
we we're having that still as our primary, but now we're building additional capacity here in the US. So I've been doing these webinars for a few months now, and if there's one consistent theme throughout, I think most everybody, whether they're running a large R&D organization or a small R&D organization, whether they are making deals, uh, doing licensing deals, working on all sorts of different uh, arrangements with, between large and small companies, or you name it, I think that everyone kind of went through an initial period of shock of saying, oh, this is going to happen. And then they got down to it and they got into their home offices and they got on their computers and they got on the Zoom and they started organizing things and making things happen. The last six months has been extraordinary. We did a story in today's issue where we talked about record amounts of cash coming into the industry from venture capital sides, from IPO sides, you name it. And those are going, and deal making is at, at an unprecedented level as well. But I wanted to get a kind of a, I wanted to get some feedback directly from y'all that are engaged on the manufacturing side of things or talking to the manufacturers out there as well. It doesn't seem that the, the practical issues have hampered people from making the kind of progress that they need to make in manufacturing. Would you agree with that or do you, or do you, do, are there some complexities here that I'm missing? Craig, you want to start with this? Um, so I think it's fair to say it hasn't necessarily hampered uh, or stopped, but it has made it more difficult. If you look at our case specifically, we still have about 17,000 people coming to work to manufacture around the world today. And we've had to spend a significant amount of resource to make sure that those people, number one, are actually kept safe. Um, and so it hasn't been that it's necessarily hampered our ability to do that. And I would be proud to say in, on behalf of our company, actually our service levels to our patients have increased during this time period. And from our clinical su supplies perspective, we never had a clinical patient without drug. So we didn't lose anybody, but it's been done with the incredible effort of the people in our organization and with significant resource application to make that happen. So it's hard to answer the question in terms of a black and white, it's hampered or it hasn't. I think what I'd say is that our preparedness and our resilience has allowed us to serve our patients properly. And it's fair to say that as it's gone on, we've started to adjust in a way that's made it more feasible for the long term. Interesting. So Evan, how about you, the small company perspective in terms of continuing being able to handle things? Has it proven to be much of an obstruction or have you been able to do workarounds? I think we've been able to do uh, workarounds, uh, but I worry about every day in the future. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, as a single source <laughs> supply chain, which I've said a few times before, our manufacturers are located in Portugal, Spain, and the UK. And so if there's something that happens in any one of those regions, so far, our CMOs have been able to work and to be able to continue to be productive. And we're in the same spot as Merck is in terms of being able to supply for our customers. But I think there's other components that I think are more challenging, uh, as, as Craig mentioned, which is we like to be at the manufacturing sites. We like to travel to Europe and be with our manufacturing colleagues to oversee specific runs and to help them if they run into deviations. We can't travel right now to Europe. That's, that's not something we can do. And so we are doing it at arm's length, kind of depending upon what they're sharing with us, but there's no substitute for being able to walk the factory floors and to be at their side to try to resource problems when they happen in real time. And so, you know, there's a little bit more risk, I think, there for us uh, overall. In talking to the CDMOs, they've worked out some different virtual tours and different things like that to try to to try to work around it like that? Have you experienced that? And, and is that a substitute? Yeah, we have that. But it, <laughs> as I said before, and I, Craig knows this really well, it's, there's no substitute for being on the factory floor and yeah. being able to watch it and to be there. So from a policy perspective, Ann, um, the practical matters of being working on Zoom, doing workarounds and things like that, as opposed to being directly in front of the legislators and talking to them directly. How has it been? I mean, is this something where it's practical to simply shift to a technology platform or have you had some problems because of that? I think nothing beats having the face-to-face -face interaction. Um, but I did want to go back to just a couple of the challenges that industry has faced early on when we saw different patchwork of state regulations regarding who was designated as essential workers that was impacting our companies. 
So we've kind of been learning along the way through this experience, and I think we've got a lot of learnings to apply. So we've had that issue. We um, have had air cargo issues from the travel ban between the US and Europe. I didn't know until that point that actually a lot of pharmaceutical goods are carried in the uh, cargo of passenger flights. So there've been kind of a lot of new issues that have popped up during this crisis that we've need to, needed to engage on. We haven't historically engaged on immigration issues, but the fact that we haven't been able to bring our quality control experts um, easily from other countries to help inspect our manufacturing facilities and get them up to speed in the US. So we're, we're kind of identifying lots of new challenges, but as Craig said and Evan have said, we're kind of working through them. And I think we're gonna have a lot of lessons learned as we go through this. But um, I would say, you know, all of us are spending a lot of time on Zoom calls and you know, this is one of the better Zoom calls that I've been on. We haven't had any technical issues. Um, so, you know, it's a new way of doing business and we're all adapting and we're all learning as we go. So I think we've got a lot of learnings that we can apply um, into the future. And, you know, I would say a lot of this about virtual meetings and that type of thing. You know, FDA, as um, John indicated earlier, has been providing some efficiencies and flexibilities. And I think we want to look at those and say, okay, well, what can we keep as efficiencies and flexibilities moving forward? And as he mentioned, as they go into the GDUFA uh, user fee agreement, go into those user fee agreement discussions, let's look at what should be kept and maintained and what we could build upon for the future. John, you get the last word on this. Uh, I, this has been a great discussion, first of all, and thank you very much. I, I think one of the things uh, that's uh, important for us to recognize is that it really doesn't matter where the drug is manufactured, as long as we feel comfortable that quality systems are in place, the quality systems are being verified, uh, there are sufficient supplies of starting materials, consumables, whatever they are that go into the products, and we that we have a third party that's validating these quality systems. If, if we have that in place, then the general public is gonna be satisfied that what they're getting is, is a quality product. And I, I think that's what we all worry about every single day, making sure that we're putting out quality products and that the, that, uh, the general public is satisfied uh, that what they're getting is uh, both safe and effective. So uh, I think we've got some challenges ahead. Uh, but I feel comfortable that we've got uh, great people uh, working on this that can really uh, make this happen and bring us to that next level where we need to be. Okay, the next level. So I'd like to thank all of the panelists for turning out, taking some time today to talk about this. It's an incredibly important issue uh, and one we'll certainly be getting back to before the end of the year. I'd like to thank the audience also for taking your time to spend it with us today as we talk about it. And I'd like to thank Grand River, our sponsor for today's conversation. With that, it's a wrap. Thanks very much. And we'll see you, see you next time. <laughs>